So I am so honored to moderate such an incredible panel of women. We have Annabelle Moynihan, Haley Hoffman-Smith, Joya Das, and Sue Yasov. And what we'll do first is have each woman give a quick, like, two to three sentence bio. Annabelle, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I am an author. I'm the author of three books for young adults um, and also a uh, collection of essays for moms, which is based on a column that I write. Fantastic. Haley, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Haley. I'm a motivational and keynote speaker and the author of a book titled Her Big Idea, which encourages women to go after their big ideas. Fantastic. Sue, you want to go next? Sure. I'm Sue Yasov. I'm the vice president of thought Le leadership for Synchrony Financial, and um, I help executives and um, small business owners promote themselves as thought leaders. And Joya. I am a longtime television anchor here in New York City, and about eight years ago, I founded a leadership platform just for South Asian executive women and founders. So I've now left television. This is my full-time hustle, and I'm really uh, excited to be on your panel today. Oh, that's great. Well, all of you are just absolutely amazing, and I know this is going to be a great event tonight. So why don't we start off with a question for Joya. Joya, what accomplishments in your career led you to found Lady Drinks. And tell us what that is, please. So Lady Drinks is a leadership development platform just for South Asian executive women and founders. And uh, what I basically did was that I pulled from my 20 years of being a business news anchor and moved the dynamic of interviewing CEOs out from behind a television screen and moved it in front of a live audience. One, to create teaching moments, but two, to really curate the room so that this demographic of women could start to build their own support systems for whatever success means to them. And that is really kind of born out of the pain points from my own story, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to become a TV anchor. But when you tell that to your Indian immigrant parents who are not emotionally equipped to support a dream like that, especially for a girl, and they aren't financially equipped, I really had to do this alone. I paid for college. I paid for grad school. I paid for every move around the country to come to New York and, and do this for a living. But I realized that I really had to, I had to install other smart women and other start smart men from college onwards as my support system in order for me to be standing here today. So that's truly the mission with which I lead my women's movement today, which is called Lady Drinks. Oh, that's what a great story. Um, so let, next, Haley, what courses and experience led you to your current career and tell us about your book and your speaking gigs? Sure. So when I was 18, I had my first ever entrepreneurial idea, but I didn't know it was an entrepreneurial idea at the time to start a nonprofit to donate books around the world to girls and mentoring groups. So my mom urged me to push that a little bit further. So I also came up with a um, mentorship curriculum that would go along with the books too. So the girls could go through the self-guided curriculum, get the messages from the books, the books were I am Malala and Jane Eyre, and then talk through the empowering messages together because I'd always cared about books and I'd always cared about women's empowerment. Um, so after that started and went really successfully, spreading to Pakistan and the Philippines, um, and around Europe, I saw firsthand how an idea that you could have in your head, if you take action on it, could go out into the world and impact people's lives, which was the single most experience, um, empowering experience of my life since I was only 18 and um, just starting out my college experience. So I got really interested in entrepreneurship from there. Uh, I started to study gender studies and entrepreneurship at Brown, and I wrote my honors thesis on female self-agency and entrepreneurship and venture capital. So that's looking at the hindrances to women deciding to pursue an idea. You know, when they come up with an idea, how are they going to decide to go after it? Or that when they are going after it, how big are they going after it? How confident are they when they're going after it? And in these rooms that are primarily marked by a lot of men in the room or in the VC sphere in 2017, only 2% of VC spending went to female founders. So I was really interested in that statistic and how to push past that uh, with my thesis. So then my book, her big idea uh, my intention with the book is that women read it and by the end of the book they decide okay i'm going to trust this nagging voice within me and go after that big idea because now i feel like i can do it um, and the book is really an accessible version of the thesis so it's not as academic it's much more fun to read but shares really cool stories of women who have done it before and then a bit about my own experiences too and then my speaking tour is called your big idea so it's for both men and women 
and I primarily speak at colleges. So I've spoken at places like Harvard, Yale, Bryn Mawr, thanks to Susanna in the introduction. And that's just to encourage all college students, like, hey, if you have a dream or an idea within you, you should go after it because that's yours for a reason. So yes, I'm out to empower people to go after their ideas. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. And so now let's go to Sue. Sue, how did you end up with a career in thought leadership? And what do you do at Synchrony in thought leadership? Oh, Sue, we got to unmute you. Grant, make sure Sue's unmuted, please. There okay. Hi. Sorry about that, Susanna. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the title of thought leadership is not um, something that everyone um, goes after. You know, we all would like to be known as thought leaders, but it's not like we want to be the v v VP of thought leadership. So how that evolved is I was really um, uh, doing value proposition at Synchrony. So I was heading up developing value propositions for our retail clients. And I wrote a white paper about it. And I said, this is the process of how a brand can develop themselves as, um, you know, with the perfect value proposition for them. And then after that digital, you know, this goes back a little while, uh, five or six years ago, and digital marketing was a big thing. So I wrote a white paper on the impact of digital marketing in retail and then I wrote another white paper because at the time retailers were really struggling with um, holding on to their baby boomer customers and attracting millennials and you could argue um, you know that that's still maybe a challenge today and I wrote, wrote a white paper based on a lot of research of you know how uh, brands and retailers could do that so after these white papers uh, they asked me to take the role on as the VP of thought leadership. And of course, you know, people don't really absorb content through white papers anymore. That was a little while ago. So now the role has evolved to more digital media, digital videos, podcasts, um, infographics, and things like that. So I uh, take the strategy of the company and try to promote thought leadership in terms of um, being more futuristic. Well, how, are, how are people consuming out there? What are they telling us about themselves? What are they telling us about their intentions? And helping the, the um, corporation really evolve to be more futuristic in our um, strategies and goals. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So on to Annabelle. Annabelle, well, you majored in English in college and have an MBA in finance. How do you use these skills to guide your career in writing and communication that you do so well? Well, what I studied in college, you know, I read a lot of books and I took a lot of writing classes. Um, I think that I probably would have learned how to write anyways. Um, I'm not sure that writing is something you can teach. Um, but I do think looking back that it's all of the reading I did, um, all the different kinds of reading that I was actually forced to do that I might not have done on my own that really helped me um, as a writer and a storyteller and a communicator. Um, I think it's very much about words in and words out. And anybody, whether you're writing or you're speaking or you're marketing, anybody who's trying to be a communicator, I think it's so important to just sit down and read every day so that you are, you're expanding your breadth of experience, you're, you're understanding diverse cultures, you're not making a fool out of yourself. Um, I think that's really important. And then after college, I, I worked in finance and I, um, I got an MBA and that has helped me actually with the other side of being a writer. Um, I do a lot of speaking. Uh, you gotta go out there, you gotta talk about your book. Um, that is very much a, a curriculum that puts you out in front of people and sort of you know draws you out. And I think that that was probably really helpful for me um, for what I'm doing now. I also think that if you want to ever tell a story that's worth anything, you have to suffer some pain. So I would recommend investment banking if anybody wanted to <laughs> give that a try. <laughs> a little bit. Excellent. Well, that's what great, what great insights. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to give um, a question to two of the panelists. So Grant, if you could make sure that uh, Joya is unmuted. So the first one is for Joya and Haley. Um, Joya and Haley, how do you see the future of branding and communication intertwined 
And what does that mean for our global economy, especially with COVID-19? Haley, you wanna go first? Sure. So to answer this question, I'll first give a little overview of how I define personal brand because personal brand is really my niche or my expertise. <laughs> so I see personal brand as this formula or combination of your personality and your purpose. So for me, you know, I talked a bit about my own experience. My purpose is helping people go after their big ideas. You know, there are other people out there who may share that same purpose, but nobody has your same personality. And your personality and your story is how you connect with your target audience and your target consumer. Uh, so when you combine those two, you're both inspiring people through your purpose or doing some act of service through your purpose. And then also, you know, having people feel a connection with you because of your personality. So with COVID-19 and these troubled times, at least in the ways that I'm shifting my own personal brand. Um, the first is from that purpose perspective and making sure that you're not being tone deaf still with certain messages. So again, my whole thing is like, go after your big ideas. And I still have this urging, of course, to be like, ooh, now is a great time for you to start that company if you lost your job. But also knowing that that's not gonna resonate with everyone in the same way. So instead, how can you still have that purpose of, you know, is there a way to innovate right now? Is there a way to think this through in an optimistic way right now? while also making sure you're appealing to more people or to all people. And then on the personality front, I also think it's great for both companies and individuals right now to feel like they can share the ways that COVID is affecting them personally. Um, for me, you know, I moved to New York City on February 1st, was there for five weeks, and then COVID hit, so I'm back home in Denver, so talk about a momentum loss, um, but I think people want to hear, you know, how it's impacting everyone else, how they're coping with it, it makes us feel less alone, especially because I mainly use Instagram, so I'm on social media a lot, you know, we're all in our own homes by ourselves or with very few people, and we need that sense of human connection. So the more that you can lean into your story and share your personality, even if you know, up to date you've been more professional, you only really share your work side, that's really gonna build that trust with consumers in your target audience or your followers in your community, however you wanna define it. And I see that moving forward being more and more important. Like we are becoming a more increasingly virtual world and I think now we're seeing how working from home and remote working is much more realistic than we thought before. And also how being virtual, like even all the panelists tonight and you, Susanna, like we are all in different areas, but we're all coming together right now. And I think it's cool that we're seeing more and more how this is working. You know, we all wanted to combine over this one purpose of this panel tonight. And I see that happening more and more frequently in the future. Maybe we won't have to do a lot of things in person. And, you know, since I'm a motivational speaker and that's like the bulk of um, how I make my money, I'm seeing how I have to adjust and then be more, you know, uh, have more of a presence virtually, share my message more virtually. So I think in general, as we're moving towards being more virtual and not being with each other in, in person, that personality piece of sharing your story, being vulnerable and showing up as you as a person more so than you as a business or your professional side is going to become really important for establishing that trust. So well said, and I think it's really all, like, I love how you said about being sen sensitive, being yourself, being authentic. I think that's going to be very important in the virtual world. Joya, do you want to add to this as well? She's muted. Oh, Grant, can you unmute Joya, please? And Joya, I'll, I'll repeat the question for you, too. It's like, how do you see the future of branding and communication intertwined, sure. and what does that mean for our global economy? So I'm going to tell a story. I was connected to a really lovely woman the other day. She runs a nonprofit that provides holistic wellness to battered women. And she was connected to me for two reasons. One, because I have a network and two, because I'm South Asian. And she, while had had, had enjoyed a great amount of success fundraising from her friends and family, she wanted to widen the net. And so she came to me because she wanted fundraising ideas on how to widen the net. And the question I asked her was, are you on social media? And she said, no, it's not my thing. And I was like, so let's, let's think about this. If you had not told your friends and family that you had this nonprofit and then went one step further and asked for the money, would you even have a viable organization today? No. Okay. So if you want to widen that net, I think putting out a digital footprint of who are you, what do you value, what is an ideal donor, 
who are you helping and how are you transforming their lives are very important pieces that should be out there in the ethernet, right? And I think, I know what the wheels were going in her head when she said, no, I guess not, it's not my thing, is that she thinks that this is boasting, but it's not about boasting. It's about how are you gonna connect to that ideal client or that ideal donor that is empathetic to your cause, but you haven't reached them yet because you haven't put anything out there that tells me that you even exist. So let's transfer that now to this current environment. If you're a business and you're operating, I want to know. If you're, doing, if you're a restaurant and you're doing takeout, I want to know. How are you protecting me? How are you protecting your employees? And how are you injecting a little bit of personality into it? There's a restaurant in North Carolina that's sending a little bar of soap with every single takeout order, just a little cheeky reminder that you should be washing your hands. Um, there's a hair salon here in New York City that's making custom hair color kits so people can you know, color their hair at home. But like, they are, what am I going to remember after this is all said and done? Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that you can't be tone deaf to what's happening, but I love that they've risen to the occasion and met me where I'm at. And so long after this is over, I'm going to remember that brand because they did that for me. That's really inspiring, Joy. I love that. Thank you for sharing those anecdotes. Um, and now we'll go to a question for Sue and Annabelle. Sue and Annabelle, what is the most important piece of advice you give to future and current leaders, both men and women, for branding communication? Annabelle, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. You know, Haley, I really love what you said about purpose and personality. Um, it's sort of a better said thing that way of saying what I'm going to say. Uh, but I think it's really important when you start out and you have like that firepower to get your business or your profession off the ground, you have something that you want to do. And whether, let's say that's, um, you want to keep people healthy, right? You, that can manifest itself in a hundred different ways. And it can change with technology. It can change with communication systems. It can change with need. It certainly would change right now. But if you end up marketing something that has nothing to do with getting people healthy, your brand suffers and your authenticity suffers. So I would just encourage people to just always go back to what that first thing was that they wanted to do. Like when I write, my intention is always to say something that I believe is true and that people can connect to and feel is true. And I will sometimes sit down to write something that is a little clever and a little edgy, and it actually has no truth to it at all. And I'll scrap it before I send it out because it's not, it's not the sort of thing that people are expecting from me. So my advice would just be to always remember where you started and what you set out to do. Oh, that's great, that's great. Now, Sue, do you wanna to add to that? Yeah, and I think that's, um, you know, great advice. And I think that it came up um, to, from a couple of um, a, the women who spoke today. Um, authenticity is so important. So I'd like to pivot more to um, the in crisis times part of the conversation. So, you know, we are not in normal times, obviously. So the um, marketing messages that you want to say now um, are a bit different than what you, may, uh, what you may ordinarily wanna say to your clients. So let's say you're a small business and you wanna put out um, marketing. You don't wanna to lose touch with your clients or your prospective clients. And there's really a way to do that. I think um, number, way is, uh, number one, the way it's been mentioned before is authenticity. You know, don't go from um, representing something to your audience and then in a crisis you represent something else. I think that um, that break of authentic authenticity is, um, you know, that has repercussions. The other thing that um, I think from being through the 9-11 crisis in New York City and the um, 2008 um, financial um, meltdown is uh, you really want to be compassionate and address the situation. So don't ignore in your communication, in your branding and in your marketing, you know, don't send out emails that appear a little tone deaf. You know, um, we, you, the time to wear strappy sandals. Maybe this is not the message, right? So do have a bit of caring, compassion and communication, but really um, from looking, you know, we, uh, often observe a lot of um, research has gone on in the field since the crisis happened. And uh, a lot of people say the number one thing that they want is dependability. So 
be who you are and be dependable uh, that you are there for them. So let's say you're a small, you have a small law firm. You want your clients to know, I am here for you. I may not be able to meet you in person, but I am here for you in terms of a video chat or something. But it, or if you have a health business and if you make um, cosmetics or you sell something, just um, reach out with caring and authenticity, but also be dependable, do what you say you're going to do. So um, those are some things that, um, that we found in marketing really works in terms of times of crisis. Oh, Sue, that's great. I think the dependability is so well set in this economy. I think especially in dealing with clients, even dealing with coworkers, even doing, dealing with your own employees, just letting people know that you're there for them and that the company and, and where we are is, is dependable. So now what we're going to do is take some questions from the audience. I'm going to moderate those. Grant, if you could go, anybody else who wants to add a question, put it in the chat and Grant Keith, our intern, will help. But I'll start with a few. Let's see, so number one, how can companies show their thought leadership in times of crisis? This is a little bit of what Sue was saying, but Haley, do you wanna add a little bit further to that? Yeah, um, I'll just briefly say, I think it's, depending on the size of your company, coming together and choosing a particular message, I think is profound. Like. For when that question was asked for some reason, it's probably because I saw the news headline today, but like thinking of Shake Shack and yeah, they like returned the the loan and they were worried about how that would come across. Um, but generally it's like, what do you want to stand for right now? And is that sacrificing on your end to support other small businesses? Like, is there something where you and all of your employees want to get together and donate your stimulus checks to, you know, a boys and girls club or something, like whatever it is. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a service aspect, but it could even be like tackling the situation with some humor and like finding cute. Like I did a Instagram post where I found like kind of cute and funny memes and tweets regarding the shutdown. And there was like this cute picture of a dog driving a car and sending your dog to get groceries because dogs can't get coronavirus. Just like lighten the mood a little bit um, because that's very me because I like to be funny and you try to be optimistic. So I think getting together with your team and just deciding like, what is it that we want to stand for right now? And do we want to take a stance right now and use this time for thought leadership? or not, because I don't think every company or every individual needs to take this time and use it as a stage. Well said, well said. You know, it's important, like everyone keeps saying, to be sensitive. Um, let's see, so what are some differentiators that can set companies apart? Joya, do you want to take to that? Because you sort of alluded to that in your earlier comments. I'm a big fan of listicles. So I'm constantly reading, and to Haley's point and to Sue's point, you know, if you're an accounting company, you know, what are the five tips that you're offering on how you could file your taxes, even though they may not do it till July? Or I know of my bookkeeper is actually walking people through on Zoom calls through their small business applications and their PPP, applica PPP applications. But she's out affording that Zoom call so that she can course correct in real time and say, oh, you know, you shouldn't pick that, you should pick this. So I think that um, people that are doing things that are not necessarily tangential to what they do, but are an extension of what they do, and, and talking about it, and making it easy for me to find them or refer them when I know that somebody has that need is probably the best favor that they could be doing. I don't mind the thought leadership, but I need it to be, uh, and I think Sue made this point earlier, I need it to be germane to what it is that you already do. If you're a firefighter, I don't want you talking about my taxes. <laughs> right. That's a good one. I like that. And definitely like a big shout out to all our healthcare workers and all the people that are on the front line right now. We really appreciate you. And I know every single one of us has someone in our family who is out there doing that. Um, so an, an, the next question is, what are some of the future trends in marketing and communications that you foresee as companies emerge from this crisis? Annabelle, you want to take that one? Well, we'll see. Um, you know, I, th I, think, I think there are a lot of habits that we've gotten into just personally that we're going to keep going for a while. Um, and I think people will be marketing to us at home uh, more actively. Um, and I think, I think that most companies are going to be um, focusing their brand more on, a, um, more on a feeling than more on materialism as we go forward. I think that we're all going to come out of this a little bit um, wrung out 
And I think, I think we're all going to be changed from it. And I don't think that most consumers are going to want to have people shoving things down their throat all the time. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I see marketing going more to the heart and less to the stuff. I have an add on to that. Please. Um, I saw a beautiful, a beautiful ad yesterday by Apple and you didn't even know there was Apple to the very, very end. But what draws you in is this emotion, right? So they had all the people on Zoom who were playing chess with their kids. This guy created a wave out of like a cardboard and his kids were playing in it. It was all the creative ways that people are essentially at home, but doing interesting things, right? right. And, uh, and at the end, it was like, brought to you by Apple, right? And so Apple has always been about creativity and they didn't necessarily go off the reservation with that. They were talking about all the ways that were being creative in this particular time, in this period of time. So I really loved it. It was totally emotional. And by the end, I wanted to know what the brand was that was, that was putting together this beautiful commercial. Julia, did you see the commercial, the, um, sorry, the Uber commercial? I didn't. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful bunch of images about people sheltering in place. Yeah. And then at the end it says, thank you for not using Uber right now. Mm -hmm. Oh. And yeah. I thought that was like such a, a nice turn for them to take. Like, no, we shouldn't be in an Uber. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great. Well said. I think it really is going to be all about the heart because we're now focusing on the, it's given us time to focus on what's really important. Family, friends, you know, the values of staying healthy, wellness. I think that's really key. Um, another question, and this one's for Sue. Are there long-term trends that will take hold as we emerge from this? Kind of what the team was talking about earlier. Is there anything different that, that you might see? Yeah, wow. Um, long-term, well, uh, we haven't even emerged from, from this. So it's really hard to say what is the long term, what will happen. Let's say, um, you know, we have different news cycle every day now. So let's say in a year, let's say that's long term. I do. I think um, just like travel became very different after um, September 11th, 2001, I think health is going to be front and center for a while. So um, in uh, almost every aspect, you know, when you go to work, you're going to think about how do I stay um, safe and healthy at work? How do I stay safe and healthy when I'm traveling, when I'm going to a hotel room, when I'm going to a meeting? So I, I think that is going to stay for a little while. Um, the other things are really things that when you think about it, um, may take a long time to get back. For instance, you know, maybe people are thinking international travel, you know, I, I would want to, but not right now. Um, maybe it's going to take longer to get back in, into a cruise. So cruise lines may, uh, certain aspects of them may have to pivot. So there are um, long-term impacts, I think, to the way we work, the way we travel, um, the way we meet each other. You know, maybe now it's going to be um, in the short term, uh, the first things that you'll get back is probably gatherings with small uh, friends and family, right? As you go further, maybe you go to a small restaurant, right? Or something small in your neighborhood, a barbecue. And then you start venturing out. And, um, you know, this happens in crisis. A lot of times crises happen all of a sudden and their recovery is slow. Um, so we may see um, an urban shift from out of urban areas into rural areas. But again, like what happened in 9-11, the crisis happens very quickly and the recovery happens over time. And then in about four or five years, you get back to where you used to be as, um, as a society. But um, I, I do think it's going to take a while and it's going to have to be step by step. No, we so appreciate that, that outlook, Sue. That's, that's excellent. So we have a couple more questions. Let's see, given the sudden shutdown, most small businesses are switching their B2B and B2B strategies to online marketing and sales. How best can small businesses generate leads online? Who'd like to take that? Joya. Um, I think you can start an Instagram shop. You can start a Facebook shop. You can start um, a shop on Shopify. You could go on bigcommerce.com. Um, I think there are a lot of sites that essentially make it easy for you to make that transition. And they have marketing modules kind of built in to blast out to, to their network. If you think 
talk about a Shopify, people already know about it. So they're probably already instinctively going on there to buy other things. And can you use AI to be able to push your product in front of them because it's a similar item? So today I, you know, I'm about to moderate a panel on May 5th for a huge conference and I had to buy a green screen, right? So I was searching for green screens and they're out of stock, they're out of stock, they're out of stock. But I have a module that comes up on my screen that says, well, actually this place has it in stock and you can get it for $4 cheaper. So I think that that, you know, it's figuring out the, the AI that's going to help you to get in front of other people. Oh, fantastic. Anyone else want to add anything to that one? And we have plenty of questions, so no worries. Um, another question, how do you think about the frequency of messaging with consumer in these times? Haley, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, I think now is a good time. I, so this could kind of like lead off from the previous question too, if you're switching to mainly online and doing digital marketing, to take advantage of remote team members, but in different time zones. So you can uh, decrease the amount of wait time when a customer is reaching out to you because it's the main thing that they ask for when it comes to better customer service. Um, so getting back to them as soon as possible and then also utilizing Instagram DM as a way of accessing people more quickly, like email, people just don't get back to email anymore. So how can you take advantage of social media right now and social media messaging in particular, uh, especially cause you have more time on your hands to do so and more people are online than ever before. So that would be my advice. Great. Excellent. Anybody else want to say anything about that? Annabelle, do you have anything, any thoughts? Uh, about the frequency of contacting right. people, I um, I personally feel like people should be contacting me a little bit less. Well said. I, I just, I don't have as much free time on my hands as people think, and I find that my email inbox is people trying to entertain me with stuff, you know, to watch and do, and I have plenty to watch and do. So, you know, we're all trying to just hunker down in a crisis, so I, I feel like less is more. I would offer up WhatsApp for business. I think that that's a really underutilized tool for communicating with your customers. But if you set up a business page on WhatsApp, you have the ability, as soon as somebody says, I want to order a cake or I want to get flowers, you're, you can communicate with your customers directly if you set up a, a WhatsApp business page. Hmm. Joya, thank you. I, I didn't even realize you could do so many of those things. And I, I understand also that eBay is offering pages for at a low cost to also to small businesses. You know, maybe somebody's tried that and could share that with us privately. Um, and then we have one more question. Let's see. So what aspect of COVID-19 has been most difficult for communicating within your businesses and how do you overcome these problems? Sue, do you want to try this one? Sure. Yeah, I think that um, the aspect of uncertainty I think is the most difficult to address because if, um, you know, if we knew when it was going to be over and we could make a plan going forward, then um, I, I think the market would get better or we would know what we're dealing with. But it's not only the health um, impact, of course, and the the impact to our financials and the impact to millions of Americans in terms of being unemployed. So of course, those are the big problems. We see those problems, right? But the difficulty um, moving forward, I think is there's so much uncertainty and uncertainty um, feeds anxiety and stress and fear and it's all that that is i think the biggest thing that um that the hurdle that you want to get over as a small business and as a large business you know synchrony has sixteen thousand employees we have call centers with thousands of people who um who uh, many of whom now are taking calls out of their homes and who need to be social distanced so you're not only de dealing with um, you know, your employees, if you're a larger company, you're also dealing with how do we interact with the public and really show our best face. Um, for smaller organizations, I think that um, it's the uncertainty, like for a restaurant, you don't know when you're gonna open. It could be very different um, according to the type of business you're in and the physical location you're in. So, um, so that becomes very difficult as well. 
No, that's great. Anybody else want to add anything about this? I know this is a tough, this is a tough one. Great. Well, Joya? Oh, Grant, can you unmute Joya, please? Could you repeat the question again? Sure, definitely. Um, what aspect of COVID-19 has been the most difficult for communicating within your business and how do you overcome these problems? Um, I don't know that I necessarily have an answer to that because I immediately pivoted all of my programming to virtual and so this is how I communicate with all my members now. I, but I just, as, as Sue was talking, I just think the economic impact is going to be far more far reaching and it's just going to take a really long time to recover from. I think the health part might, might sort itself out sooner, but the economic damage is, it's unfathomable to me. It really is quite devastating. Um, yeah, and I think in terms of what can you do for the next part of that um, question that I didn't address, um, I think showing compassion and really reaching out. I think it was um, maybe Annabelle who said this, but really reaching out and showing compassion, showing caring and looking for more um, the community connections and loyalty rather than, you know, um, uh, addressing the financial impact uh, it would be helpful. But of course, for small businesses, incredibly hard to do. I think it's, yeah, it's definitely gonna be at this stage where some things you certainly can't do, like for example, hair color, it's gonna be about fostering the community. And to that end, we have a question along those lines. Um, how do people that have hands-on businesses like physical therapy or massage deal with social distancing and the inability to meet with their customers? So I'm actually writing an article on this right now um, because there's this new platform called Better PT, I believe. So it's all these physical therapists who are coming onto this platform to do telehealth. Uh, so it was really interesting to hear about, you know, when you think of physical therapy, you think of like maybe they're like massaging your muscles or they're leading you through the exercises and they've had to get really unique on things like I'm going to be picking up a laundry basket and using that as my like stand in material or whatever to go through these exercises. Um, but it's been forcing these companies um, and these health providers to think further about how to be virtual. And they've said that there's been actually some benefits to it because then you really can talk people through, you know, like the things that you don't really get into the nitty gritty of when you're actually in person with them because you get right on into the exercises that you're supposed to do. So they found some benefit in it. That doesn't mean they're going to like transition to virtual forever, but they've actually said that they'll probably keep that virtual and that telehealth component for things like, oh, somebody thinks they can't show up for an appointment because they got off work late, like maybe we'll do telehealth moving forward. So a lot of people have needed to pivot in that way. The biggest concern has been insurance companies because every insurance company has had to, you know, have a different code for that or they have different rules applying for if that actually counts as a physical therapy session, et cetera. But yeah, it's just new opportunities. And on that end too, I think for people who are like hairdressers or color hair, there's the opportunity to do things like, you know, create a cute little Instagram story of ways to wear your hair to cover up your roots. Cause my roots are certainly coming in. So I'm looking for something like that or like here are cute hats that I recommend or, you know, different ways that you can do your hair on your own in the meantime. And again, that goes back to fostering that community and that sense of trust. So you do go back to that hairdresser when things open up again. Great. Does anyone else want to um, add anything about that? Joy, go ahead. Oh, Grant, Joy's got to be off again. So I, um, I had a conversation with a pediatric dentist today, and he was talking about all the different ways that he is reaching um, his patients at a time when they're probably going to have emergencies or they're going to have needs to be, you know, they need to be seen. And so he talked about a couple of tools, something called mouthwatch, similar to what Haley was talking about, but it's a conglomeration and it's a, it's a tool for dentists uh, to be able to use. And it's, I think it's HIPAA compliant, which is another consideration. Um, and then there was something called asynchronous conferencing. Again, it's allowing doctors to kind of come together and be able to either let's say you've got 18 doctors that report into you, you're able to share case studies, you're able to share cases, you're able to talk about patients and you're able to you know, arrive at some best practices. So I just think that that's something that shouldn't go away. How great is that, that you can do that even, even if you're siloed in different locations? Mm -hmm. No, that's fantastic. Um, and now we have, we're gonna take one more question. 
Um, and that's, as a recent college graduate, how should I address the way I reach out to professionals I want to network with virtually in a way that's authentic, respectful, and also kind of mm -hmm. taking into account that so many people are actually out of work as well. Who would like to uh, take that? Annabelle, some thoughts? I, you know, I just love that someone's asking that question. Uh, because I think some, I think when you're young and you know you're graduating from college and you're thinking I need a job and that's the only thing you're thinking about and it is such a nice way to approach somebody who is you know older and more established than you are to acknowledge I realize this is a difficult time I realize you're making some difficult decisions with your business um, having said that if you have any free time. I would like to talk to you, but to you know, to preface it by by not seeming clueless. Um, I, I just think that's such a. It's the fact that that person asked that question. I think they're they're already there. I think it's great. Uh, yeah, and also, um, if I could just add, it's almost um, uh, similar to networking rules. Uh, you don't just ask them what they can do for you right away. I think the more as um, you start reaching out to people, and this applies to everyone um, as well, the more you say, um, you know, I have this interesting article that based on your background, it might interest you, or, you know, can I help you in any way? Can I introduce you to someone who, um, who you might want to meet or something? Um, it might be a better way, a better entree, to um, meet people and, and network with people um, rather than just jumping in and saying, hey, you know, I'm looking for a job. So um, that, that I think is more important now maybe. And, um, you know, maybe do some volunteer work. I know a lot of people meet um, pot potential employer, employers or other network contacts through um, volunteering in the community. So that might be something um, to try. I have a tactical piece of advice. If you go on LinkedIn, which is my favorite place to network, and you just put into the search bar, we are hiring, you'll see that in people's taglines, all the companies that are hiring right now have put it in their taglines. So that gives you a great tip of people that you can start to network with right now because they are hiring. That's such a great tip. Haley, anything you want to add too? Yeah, one thing, just like as another tactical tip when you're reaching out to places, it, and like especially if you don't know if they're hiring but you're interested, is to offer something that you really like about what they're doing and then also offer a suggestion that's not at all a criticism or like, oh, you're doing this wrong, you should fix it, but a, a suggestion because then it shows that you're thinking critically, it shows what you can offer. Like one example of this is if you look at somebody's social media feed for a company, you can be like, oh, I really loved how you spotlighted your CFO. Um, I have a suggestion for you. You should do this because, you know, it'd be really cool to hear about how customers are benefiting from your service. So it just shows them that you're thinking critically, that you took the time to care and also shows them how you think. And so they're like, Ooh, I'm interested in this person. I see how they could offer value. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what you said could also apply to anyone, you know, mm -hmm. looking for a job right now. So thank you everyone. Well, I think I want to thank everybody for all the questions. I think we need to do a wrap given that it's around seven, 23 and I really want to thank our panelists Annabelle, Haley, Sue, and Joya. You've been fantastic and I think there's been so much synergy in, in what you've said and hopefully for everyone on the discussion tonight you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been really informative. There's been some brilliant insights and I think we're all really hungry for this information because so much is unknown and it, and it is a bit scary and but I think the key thing is for us to all be authentic and to help each other and be as dependable as we can. So just wanted to close this out that, um, you know, be sure to, to subscribe to Hello Career Guru. We're open to your ideas, things that you need, and we hope to do another panel soon. And most importantly of all, we wish everyone good health and safety. And so thank you for coming tonight. That's it. Thank you, Susanna. Bye. Have a good Bye -bye. one. Bye, everybody be safe.